Rumpelstiltskin always says that magic comes with a price. But for this price, you can get a nice piece of jewelry. Use code ONCEPOD for 10% off your first order at Unusual Magic Jewelry on Etsy. Click the link in the description. Hello, and welcome to the Once Again Podcast. We are your hosts, Ashley and Jason. On today's episode, we will be discussing Once Upon a Time, Season 1, Episode 10, 7.15 a.m. The story was written by Edward Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. The teleplay was written by Daniel T. Thompson, and it was directed by Ralph Hemmecker. And just to clarify, what that means is Adam and Edward came up with the idea, and Daniel was actually the one to physically write the script. Okay. It premiered January 22nd, 2012, and had a viewership of 9.33 million. A brief synopsis, Mary, Margaret, and David struggle with their feelings for each other, while Emma and Regina become suspicious of a mysterious arrival in Storybrooke. And the title card I found interesting because it featured Red Riding Hood. Yeah, I actually couldn't figure out what that was supposed to be like I knew it was somebody walking away from the viewer and mm-hmm. like until about halfway through that like oh that was supposed to be red wasn't it and mm-hmm. then I was like why why well even that, ha- this like, was- she has a big part in this episode but like she also isn't the main part of this episode so I feel like it's a very interesting choice yeah we uh, we pointed out similarly in the Jiminy Cricket episode how uh Rumpelstiltskin spinning wheel was the title card Um, And it did feature in it, but it wasn't a big part. But even this episode on the Blu-ray has commentary. And the commentary was Josh Dallas and Jennifer Goodwin. And when the title card came up, Jennifer Goodwin said, is that me or is that red? And I was just like, oh, okay. Like that's like, then she was like, oh no, wait, that's red. Like, so even like- Yeah, definitely an interesting, because it doesn't make sense that it would be Mm -hmm. red here. Like. Mm -hmm. This I, isn't a red episode. This isn't red centric. No, she does. She shows up kind of in the beginning and at the end, and that's that's pretty much it. But I have a note here that during the previously on, during the recap montage, uh, the shots of Prince Charming and Snow White were uh, mirrored versions of the shots from Snow Falls. Therefore, Charming Scar is on the wrong side of his face. Oh. Yeah. So we start off in Storybrooke. The recent arrived stranger is being questioned by Henry Mills. Regina Mills sees them and runs over upset. My only note for the scene is that Henry wanted to know the stranger's purpose in Storybrooke. And he kind of answers his questions with questions. I find his statement interesting here that she said, he said, better get to school. Looks like a storm is coming. Mm. Is he talking about the rain? Is he talking about the storm that is Emma Swan on this entire town? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, but there certainly is both a literal and metaphorical storm coming. It's inter- I, I have this somewhere in my notes, but during the commentary, Jennifer and Josh mentioned that while they were shooting this episode, it rained every day of the shoot, except for the days that it was supposed to be the storm. And they had to, <laughs> they had to fake that rain. Wonderful. So, I just thought that was kind of funny. Might as well bring it up now. At Emma Swan and Mary Margaret's loft, Mary Margaret has overslept. She rushes to go to school by 7.15 a.m. to help her students with with a science project. She is actually rushing to Granny's Diner to run into David Nolan. I really love how serious she was. She was like, we are making a volcano. I have to go. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, Mary Margaret, take the kids seriously. Yeah. One of my notes was that the volcano that Mary Margaret says she is making with her students was present in her classroom in a previous episode, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Um, So that might be where she got the idea to tell this fib for. Oh, it does make sense. And in the commentary, Jennifer Goodwin mentioned that she was actually brushing her teeth in that scene because she hates in TV shows and movies where the actors uh, don't use real toothpaste in their mouth. 
And oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. And something that stood out to me was the chief meteorologist on the background in the TV. His name is Bill Gosling, and it was actually voiced by Damon Lindoff, the creator of Lost. Oh. Yeah. So David enters. Also, obviously, 715 is the name of the episode, too. Like, Yeah. Which I, I wonder why they, well, I guess it, it's early enough that she wouldn't have to be at school yet, and she could run into him at the diner. Uh, David enters the diner, and the two chat for a minute, then he leaves. Emma then enters and asks her what's going on. Mary Margaret admits that she cannot get David out of her head and that she has been coming here every day at 7.15 a.m. to see him. She cannot help it and wishes there was a way to cure her feelings. We mentioned on a previous episode how uh, David goes to Granny's every morning for coffee. So Ruby and Granny should have been there. It was the episode where he came home from the hospital and like all of his friends were at the party. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I was posing that hypothetically. I forgot that he actually does go to Granny's every morning. So I just, I just, well, found that so funny. does everybody else because that's apparently the only restaurant in this entire freaking town. Yeah. Do you think Mr. Gold goes to Granny's every morning? Obviously. <laughs> it's where he takes his lunches, you know? Yeah. yeah. The book Mary Margaret is reading when David comes into the copy, uh, comes into the coffee shop is Myster- The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. And that was pointed out in the commentary. Also, I'm just taking her words here. Uh, Jennifer Goodwin uh, was criticizing her haircut in this episode. She said that it looked like a bowl cut and a mullet combined. And she also pointed out that her and Jennifer Morrison as actors, they both tend to mimic what their scene partner does in the scene. And the example she used was that like they both tilt their heads in this scene. And Josh Dallas was very supportive. He said it, it was good because it actually works with them being a mother and daughter that they would have similar mannerisms. So moving right along in the Enchanted Forest, Snow White is hunting near the forest when Red Riding Hood arrives with food and news. She tells Snow White that Prince Charming is to marry King Midas's daughter in two days time. Snow White admits that she came out into the woods to help her forget him. But she has done nothing but think about him. She wishes that there was a way to forget him. Red tells her there might be a way, and she has heard rumors of a man that can help. I have a few notes about this, but the first thing that I just wanted to say was, I know Snow White's father died when she was young, but surely he would have warned her about Rumpelstiltskin. Surely everyone in this freaking place knows about Rumpelstiltskin at yeah. this point. Like, yeah, do we not know about the Dark One, the Dark Wizard? Also, in the commentary, Jennifer Goodwin said that this, the costume that she's wearing in these scenes was her favorite costume. It's the one where I don't know how to describe it exactly. She doesn't exactly look like a warrior, but she has, you know, she looks um, more like a huntsman in her yes, own right. In right, that outfit. Yeah. And they also mentioned that these scenes in the woods were the hardest to shoot because where they shot them, it's located, there's an airport on one side of the woods and a train station on the other. So it was always very loud. Yeah, I don't know why they would pick this oh, particular good spot. Choice. But yeah, yeah. They're in uh, the middle of Maine. Like they did film some of this in Maine, correct? Like, if yeah. I remember correctly. These scenes, the wood scenes are shot in Vancouver, which makes, okay. it, which makes it even stranger because... Vancouver is obviously a very remote part of Canada. Like it's it's a big province. There's a lot of woods that you could shoot where there aren't airports and train stations, but yeah. whatever. But there is a town, Stevenson, I believe is the name. And all the scenes where they're walking down the street uh, in this episode and, and other episodes, all those little shops are the town of Stevenson. And they actually told a story about there was a bread maker who he would let Josh Dallas into the store to buy bread because he thought that he was worthy, but he didn't allow most of the rest of the cast in. Like he, he had to, like he, you had to stand outside and he would let you know if you were worthy to eat his bread or not. And, oh my God, I yeah. love this man. <laughs> yeah, so Josh Dallas would get to have his bread, but most of the rest of the cast didn't. And I don't, you know, it's kind of funny. Anything else you'd like to say about this scene? No, that was, that's wild though. That's a wild story. Okay. So Snow White journeys to a lake to visit the mysterious man who is revealed to be Rumpelstiltskin. 
He uses water from the lake and hair plucked from Snow White's head to fashion a potion. He tells her the potion will make her forget Prince Charming entirely. When Snow asks his price, he says all he wants are strands of her hair, which he has already taken, but not used in making the potion. So why do we think he took the hair? Do we like, is this for just general true love's sake of having things? Because obviously we know their love is true love. Yeah. That true love is a powerful ingredient in its own right. Right. Or is this because he's all knowing and already knows the curse is going to happen and he needs that to be put into the curse so that he can break the curse later down the line so that Emma's already built into breaking the curse? I would say <laughs> with Rumpelstiltskin, there is no or, it's both. <laughs> he, he does it, yes. That's my answer. Um, yes, okay, yeah. I'll take it. Uh, this is the first episode in which Rumpelstiltskin appears, but his counterpart, Mr. Gold, does not. And in the commentary, Jennifer said that it was a real boat on a, that was to land on a real dock, but she kept crashing the boat into the dock. So they had divers in wetsuits underneath the boat moving it. Oh, that's too funny. But it, it's weird too, because Josh Dallas, uh, Josh Dallas mentions that they recreated the actual dock for them to stand on. Like that, that was shot yeah. in a lot. He said, like, they would fill it up with so much fog that, like, you couldn't even see the cameras. So it's it's just interesting that how they shoot the things. Like, sometimes it's real places, sometimes it's lots. Back in Storybrooke, Mary Margaret is shopping for supplies for an, the impending storm when she bumps into Catherine Nolan, who drops a pregnancy test. After Catherine walks away, Regina appears and tells Mary Margaret that it is the couple's personal business and to keep quiet. I have a few things here. One... Uh, the candy bars that Mary Margaret grabbed were Apollo bars, yet again, from Lost, another Lost e Easter egg. And my question is, would the curse actually allow David and Catherine to conceive a child? So I think that mm -hmm. is possible, right? Mm -hmm. Because at this point, Emma's kind of like cracked the curse at yeah. least is what we have to like take away from what time, is happening. Time is moving. Yeah, time is moving. Things are happening. She's made a crack. So mm -hmm. we're not necessarily in full curse mode anymore. Mm -hmm. That being said, I don't know if it would allow people to conceive, but I can see where it would be a possibility. Yeah. And I have an interesting note from the Once Upon a Time Reawakened book here is that in the book, Mary Margaret mentions that she doesn't like storms because something to do with swirling clouds, but she can't remember what. Uh, Obviously, she's referring to the curse itself yeah. being full of swirly clouds. Yeah, that, that's neat. That's a cute line. I like that. Also, Regina is everywhere. This woman is stalking these people. Like, how does she just happen to be in the pharmacy when they happen to bump into each other? Like, is she stalking Mary Margaret? Is she stalking well, Catherine? Like, I don't know what I she's mean, doing, but... Regina and Catherine are friends at this point. Maybe they were shopping together or something. I mean, maybe, but, like, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. In the Enchanted Forest, Prince Charming speaks with King George, who tells him that he knows Charming is in love with someone else and wants him to end it. Prince Charming is not happy with this. And as a result, he uses a dove to send a letter to Snow White, revealing his love for her and requesting that she meet him. He writes to her that if she does not come, he will know it means that she does not care for him. I found it interesting that even in private, King George calls Charming James. He knows he's not James, but he's so committed to the lie, I guess, or... I feel like he just wants to believe and he looked mm. they're twins so like to him they look exactly the same so same person yeah 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 in the commentary Jennifer Goodwin and Josh Dallas revealed that this was both of their favorite charming costumes uh, that he wears in this scene it's just a simple vest and also the letter that Snow receives was really written by Josh Dallas meaning that it's his handwriting oh that's cute mm -hmm. he said he had to write a couple dozen versions of it but <laughs> Yeah, it's really his handwriting. Back in Storybrooke, while walking through the woods, Mary Margaret sees a trapped dove. She takes it to the animal shelter where she runs into David. The veterinarian, Dr. Dr. Thatcher, tells her the bird is fine. However, the other doves of its kind are migrating, 
and that these doves mate for life. It is not reunited with its flock. There's a chance it'll be left behind. If this happens and the dove is left alone, she will be alone and miserable for the rest of her life. Mary Margaret is upset by this and goes out into the woods before the storm arrives to find the other doves, despite David warning her not to. Meanwhile, Regina asks Emma to look into who the stranger that has come to town is. Emma rejects Regina's request until Regina informs her that the stranger was in front of Regina's home and taking a quote unquote particular interest in Henry. So my first question here was, who is Dr. Thatcher? Uh, we talked off camera about this. Uh, we don't really... I don't know. Uh, if you, the viewers, have any idea who Dr. Thatcher is, like, yeah. please let me know. Because uh, please let us know. We're yeah. like, we have no clue. Yeah. If you're on uh, YouTube, write it in the comments. If you're, if you're on Twitter. Yeah. Tweet us or send yeah, us an email. Tweet us. Let yeah. us know. Yeah. Because um, I'm curious. Like, I have no clue who it would be, but obviously it's got to be someone. Yeah. And then also that the North Atlantic dove described by Dr. Thatcher as a migratory species, very unique among American doves, which forms strong monogamous, monogamous bonds is a fictional species created for the show. It does not exist in real life. I didn't even look that up. I just assumed it was a real bird. Nope. Yeah. Why would they make up a fake bird? There's plenty of other birds. Well, I'm sure there are birds that do form strong attachments and can't be separated. Yeah. Uh, penguins. <laughs> There's no penguins in me. That's, yeah, that was my point. I don't know. But, it, it, you know, you hear this thing in other, like, um, other movies or TV shows have turtle doves that supposedly form a bond for life, but that's not really true. So I don't know. I don't know why, but it's, it's just a cute thing that they like to put in shows and movies, the lies about now animals. That just makes me interested in why they decided that so many birds out there are like monogamous and have these life bonds. Like why a bird of all creatures? You know, I think it's probably one of those things that birds are very difficult to tell apart. So they just made up this lie about birds. Maybe it's because birds are like, you know, doves and all that, especially in this case, doves are romantic. Yeah. But I, oh, yeah. I don't know. It's why make up the lie? Back in the Enchanted Forest, Snow White receives and reads Prince Charming's letter. I have two notes here. The original scene that was shot, Snow White received the letter from Prince Charming. And originally it was filmed with Charming as a background silhouette with Snow White pacing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And while shooting this scene, uh, Josh Dallas was sitting off camera reading the letter to Jennifer Goodwin. However, they actually didn't have the script of what was going to be in it. So he just improvised different versions of the letter by saying things that he liked about her. Which is cute. Well, of course it's cute. They're married now. Like, this is not spread. This is just like, okay, so we're learning all about Josh Dallas and Jennifer Goodwin's real life relationship. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to say? No. Okay. Back in Storybrooke, Mary Margaret brings the dove to the woods, attempting to find his flock. F uh, finding the road she traveled on is blocked, so she continues on foot. And Jennifer Goodwin said that she was really driving a car for all the shots of Mary Margaret driving. Realizing Prince Charming's feelings for her, Snow White prepares to sneak into King George's castle by pretending to bring a basket of flowers for the upcoming wedding. After making her way into the very room that Prince Charming is in, and just as she notices him, but before he can see her, a guard catches Snow White. She is imprisoned in the castle dungeon. While imprisoned, she meets Grumpy, who tells her about his lost love. He tried to get her a diamond, but it turned out to be stolen, and now he has been arrested. Stealthy, another one of the dwarves, breaks in and frees Grumpy and Snow White. I love that we got a new dwarf here. Yeah. I, I remember being so excited the first time watching this, being like, Stealthy? Who is Stealthy? Yeah. According to Josh Dallas, originally Stealthy's name was going to be Sneaky, which was one of the names that Disney came up with, uh, Walt Disney, that is, for the Seven Dwarves. But for whatever reason, they changed it to Stealthy. I do like the name Stealthy. It's yeah. A good name. Well, it stands out a lot more. 
Um, I mean, I see you have this note too, but this is one of my few notes is that Grumpy was whistling hi ho. Yes. Yeah. Very distinctly. And like, I don't always catch the music bits in this, but that was very distinct. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I liked it. I wrote, is this the same location as Rumpel's prison? I assume it is because it's King George's castle, which becomes charming in Snow's castle. It's just it has a different gate on it because they needed to use magic to imprison Rumpel. Hold up about that because didn't, oh, well, yeah, Grumpy did say that a lot of dwarf blood went into fixing that up in the mines. Right, do you think we're talking about stealthy there or are we talking oh. about like, are we talking about like them actually digging it out and making them and like putting the steel up to make the cage itself? Like that, That's a good question because stealthy doesn't, get actually killed down there but maybe I, I don't know that's that's still a good question that i want the answer to was it literal dwarf blood being used or just figurative or metaphorical i guess i should say so some background information about the scene while filming where snow white tries to escape the dungeon jennifer goodwin got splinters from all the climbing that she did like going up and the jail, the jail cell that Snow White is thrown into, there is a Mickey Mouse silhouette cut out at the on the top corners of it. We got a hidden Mickey, and I didn't notice. Yeah, Ugh. I didn't notice it either. This is just from the wiki. <laughs> I am gonna have to go rewatch that. Yeah, back in Storybrooke, as Mary Margaret sets the dove down, a loud crash of thunder scares her, and she slips off a cliff, nearly falling to her death and forcing her to hang on for dear life. David shows up and saves her just in time. So my background information, according to the commentary, there were two shooting locations for this. One was a real cliff that a stunt double for Mary Margaret was hanging off of. Mm -hmm. And the other was a recreation uh, stage that Jennifer Goodwin hung off of, but her feet could touch the ground. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. While escaping the castle, Stealthy is killed by King George's men, and Snow exchanges her freedom for Grumpy's life. I think what annoys me here is they should have just listened to Mary Margaret when the day she was like, we have to go this way. You can't go through the courtyard. Yeah. And they were like, nah, guards are asleep. It's fine. Yeah. No, we listened to the person who knows all about castles. Yeah. In a previous em episode, I mentioned how empty King George's castle is. Obviously, there's someone at the front gate because he arrowed uh, stealthy right through the heart. Back in Storybrooke, the storm intensifies, and David and Mary Margaret take shelter in a nearby cabin. The two express their feelings, each revealing their reason for going to Granny's at 7.15 a.m. Just as they are about to kiss, Mary Margaret asks how David can do this when Catherine is pregnant. David, however, is surprised by this information. And my only note here, I previously mentioned how it rained every other day while they were shooting this episode, except on the actual day when the storm was supposed to hit. It's so weird. But, yeah. I mean, I get it, but it just, it's very odd. Odd timing there. So Emma finds the stranger at the diner and questions him about the box he carries around. He tells her, that he could keep the contents of the box a secret and that not knowing and wondering would drive her crazy. He then tells her he will show her what's in the box if she agrees to have a drink with him or if she agrees to allow him to buy her a drink. He opens the box to reveal an old typewriter and claims that he is a writer. He leaves and Emma asks what about the drink to which he replies sometime. So interesting change for the book here. Hmm. In the book, Emma's sitting down at Granny's and August finds her. Hmm. That is very interesting. It changes like... It changes the whole dynamic of yeah. the scene. And But I also think I get that Regina and like Emma are like, yeah, we got to find out. But like realistically, the sheriff really wouldn't be like running around trying to find him. I think it makes more sense. He shows up and he's like, yeah, I see you've been following me around. What can I do for you? Hmm. Like, My only um, note on this scene... And this comes from the commentary and it's possible spoilers, but the stranger in this scene is wearing a pirate shirt and dressed very similar to another future character. Huh, I, I didn't I don't even know, notice that, but yeah, I don't know when they recorded the commentary, but when they said it, I was like, oh yeah, he is uh, dressed up. And uh, my brain went somewhere else. And I was like, wait, no, that's not right. It's that person that did that thing. 
I'll talk about it later, but, but it is interesting. Yeah, I, I, would, I have other things, but like, I don't want to get too spoilery here. I know, okay. but just right. because writer and things. Right. I'm, I'm going to bring up something later that is also borderline spoil, spoilery. Um, so at that moment, the storm breaks and Mary Margaret goes to release the dove with David chasing after her. He tells her that he feels like he has two different lives, one with her and one with Catherine. He claims the one with Mary Margaret is the only one that feels real. My notes for here were several birds doubled as the injured bird that Mary Margaret rescues. The bird used to film the scene where Mary Margaret finds the injured injured dove is called Chester. Uh, Another bird is called Buster. The birds were real homing pigeons And when they were released, they flew to their home several hours away. The rest of the flock was CGI. And then just that there was fake rain used for the scene where Mary Margaret releases the dove. The water could not be heated since using heated rain in that kind of weather would create steam. So the rain was very cold. I feel bad for her. (laughs) Back in the Enchanted Forest. Snow White is brought before King George, who reveals he knows about the letter Prince Charming sent her since Snow White dropped it when she was captured. He tells Snow White that love is a disease and demands that she tells Prince Charming that she does not love him. If she refuses, he will kill Prince Charming, not her. She asks how he could do that to his own son, and George responds by telling her that he is not his son. (sighs) nothing it's such, right. a, it's such a rough scene to watch to be honest like oh the just like what a jerk george yeah, is yeah like george is so awful yeah I'll and just... honestly the fact that she would that he would just kill james instead of being like i know you're snow way i'm gonna toss you over to the evil queen yeah i thought that was interesting like he i think in later episodes he does like say that he's going to give her to the queen or whatever like i think they have other encounters i think that's why that's why i thought that's what he was going to say here and then he's like oh i'll just kill him i'm like don't remember that but like yeah ooh, yeah the only thing i didn't write this down but jennifer goodwin and josh dallas just mentioned what a great actor the actor who plays king george is and how he's actually british in real life but he can just yeah he can just slip into an american accent like They'll do scenes and call cut and all of a sudden he's British again. And then when they call action, he's American again. Snow White goes and tells Prince Charming that she is not in love with him. Prince Charming is visibly upset and Snow White leaves. Brutal. It makes me so sad. Yeah. Also yeah. because they're in a relationship in real life. So like. Yeah. The, on- the only thing that they said about that scene was when it ends and kind of cuts to black. Josh Dallas just goes heartbreaking (laughs) he just like said the one word oh my god yeah in storybrook david and Catherine discuss their relationship Catherine tells david that she is not pregnant and is relieved she asks him if he is willing to go to therapy with dr hopper and david agrees to go he decides to skip getting coffee at the diner and instead stays and has breakfast with Catherine. In the commentary, Josh Dallas said the curse took Charming's courage away, hence why he doesn't leave Catherine despite wanting to be with Mary Margaret. It does make a lot of sense. Yeah, and Jennifer Goodwin said that Snow Snow White believes that things will work out for good people who keep trying, but the curse caused Mary Margaret not to believe that. I mean, I think it's much more than that, but yeah. yeah. Moving right along, while walking back into the woods... Snow White is joined by the remaining dwarves. Grumpy tells her that with Stealthy dead, they all lost someone today. Snow White takes out the potion given to her by Rumpelstiltskin, but Grumpy convinces her not to take it. He tells her that suffering makes one who they are. So interesting fact here is this is the particular scene that Regina saw when she was like, she's cavorting with dwarves. When did that happen? In like the last episode, I think. Yeah. I thought that I thought similarly. So Mary Margaret is visibly depressed as she is eating breakfast and looks at the clock. It is nearly 7.15 a.m. and she doesn't go to the diner either. Ah, uh, neither one of them heartbreaking. Yeah. In the Enchanted Forest, Prince Charming is looking for Snow White in the woods. 
He runs into Red Riding Hood and asks her where Snow White is. Red tells him that she is gone. Prince Charming tells Red that he will find Snow White. At the home of the Seven Dwarves, Grumpy is overjoyed when he learns that the impending marriage between Princess Abigail and Prince Charming has been called off. He rushes to Snow White's room to tell her the good news. After he informs her, Snow White cheerfully asks him who he's talking about. Shocked, Grumpy gazes at the bedside table. On it is an empty vial that once held the potion made by Rumpelstiltskin. My only notes are Charming saying, I will always find her again. Yep. And that the horse Josh Dallas rides in this scene where he meets Red Riding Hood is called Adela. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it, this is one of those words like, like obviously we know the outcome, but like, I can't believe she took that, she took the potion, but like that Rumple allowed this to happen at all. Like, this is all in Rumple's plan. Right. He's the master planner. He's at least six steps ahead of everyone else. Back in Storybrooke, Mary Margaret is in Granny's diner and David walks in. Upon seeing her, David hastily exits and Mary Margaret chases after him. She asks him what he is doing there and he tells her he's trying to avoid her. Mary Margaret tells him that she is trying to avoid him. David tells her that Catherine is not pregnant and the two kiss. Regina is revealed to be watching the couple from her car. And my only note is kissing in the middle of the street. What the heck? Yeah, forget Regina saying that, seeing that. Like, not the entire town is going to see it. Catherine's going to know in, like, 2.5 seconds. Yeah, obviously. They were overcome with emotion and everything, but it's still, like, duck down the alley or something. Also, it's one of those, when you first watch this, too, I feel like it's easy to have that moment where you go, oh, they're going to kiss. This is it. We're going to break some more of the curse or something's going to happen here. And nothing happens. Oh yeah, that's true. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like even think we're about watching that. it a second time, so we know that's not the case. But I feel like I can only imagine when I first saw this episode, I was like, "Oh, yeah. next episode's gonna be so good because like I had to have done something." Yeah. Spoiler alert: It didn't. But no. uh. So, anything else you'd like to mention about this episode? No. Okay. Well, that concludes this week's episode of the Once Again Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Any questions, comments, or critiques can be addressed to either our email at onceagainpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at onceagainpod. If you are feeling generous and would like to contribute to the podcast, we have several tiers available on patreon.com slash onceagainpod. Also, a like and a share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you and have a wonderful day.